So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so a couple of things right off the bat, actually a little bit more than a couple of things, but uh, homework, uh, homework one and project one grades are posted on Gradescope. I haven't moved them over to Canvas yet. Um, so go over there and check them uh, and make sure that there's nothing that looks weird. Um, the average on the project, there, there's like one or two more submissions that are coming in um, due to circumstances. But the average right now is 150.25. So hopefully you're pretty happy with that. Um, maybe I give a little too much extra credit, but that's fine. Um, and then the average for the homework was a 43.68. So it's pretty good out of 50. Um, homework two is due on. Friday, as will be um, this worksheet, worksheet seven. Another logistical thing, um, I'm gonna move my Wednesday office hours to Friday at 4 p.m., Friday at 1600. Um, hopefully, Maybe that'll work better for some people, especially since it's a Friday when you guys are probably going to be doing the homework anyway. Um, so that I'm going to move it there. Um, and there was a question about question two on the homework. Um, so I can pull that up, homework two. Um, so this uh, part B on question two asks you to calculate the average memory access time for um, this particular uh, this particular system with this function here. And um, the question was basically like, is the missed penalty in addition to hit time, or is that including the, the hit time and, and the answer is is that it is an in addition. So um, if you have a miss, you will incur the hit time figuring out if it's missed, and then you'll take the miss penalty on top of that. So it'll be 21 cycles for uh, that entire process. Because you have the one cycle to see is it hidden in the cache, and then 20 cycles if it is a miss and you have to go out and fetch it from your higher level cache or RAM or wherever. Okay, I think that's it logistically. Any questions? Okay, so um, There was a there was a question last week about the difference between L1, L2, L3 technologies. If there was any difference between the the type of storage, and um, I actually couldn't find any. They're they're all using um, uh, SRAM. I, I think really the the the, the difference is size, and you may have difference in associativity and other stuff like that that could incur a little bit more penalty at the higher level. Um, and obviously size is a huge factor because it, it takes time to move data um, out, of, out of the cache if it is a large cache. So um, that's where the differing like, latencies are, are most, um, most seen. Okay, uh, I want to take a few minutes to talk a little bit about the feedback that you gave me. I, I, I truly do appreciate it. Um, I'm still processing some of it and trying to figure out how to uh, address some of the, the things and figuring out how to improve, improve on them. Um, but there were, there were actually a few that were a little bit concerning on, to, to me. Um, 
uh, and kind of indicated maybe you weren't aware of some of some of the different resources and such available. And I just want to reiterate that and, you know, sorry for not communicating these um, better at, at previous times, but um, a few things that I, I did notice that you guys like lectures on YouTube, those will stay around, worksheets will stay around, and my bad jokes will stay around. You guys either loved them or hated them, so too bad if you hated them, um, you're going to have to still deal with them. Um, I, I kind of grouped your feedback into a, a couple of different categories, um, and I think that the biggest uh, three were kind of just how do we get more help? Um, some stuff about lectures, stuff about the midterm, and then stuff about the course schedule. So I'll address those in turn. As far as getting help, um, I'm not going to expand office hours. Nobody even shows up to the office hours that I do have, or very few people at least. So I'm not going to expand them, but both I and Adam, the TA for this class, are available by appointment. So just email us, and I'm more than happy to take a few minutes out of my day to um, talk to, you know, um, and, you know, I just have to work it around various meetings at work. Also, Piazza, as you know, is available. Uh, I think my statistics are pretty good. I think my response time is like 12 minutes, which I, I don't know. I mean, you could complain about that, but I, I'm not going to do anything about that. Um, so email is also available. I'm a little bit less responsive there, but I do respond fairly quickly. And matrix is basically an injection into my bloodstream um, <laughs> as far as communication goes. Because I'm on there 24 seven to my detriment. Um, so projects wise, I, I just want to remind you um, on the syllabus, do, 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 do. There's, there's this thing under expectations, this first sentence of the second paragraph that says that you're expected to be able to write either C or C++ before entering the course. And I just want to say, like, you know, obviously, if you have questions about syntax details, I, I've done a lot of crazy stuff with Voidstar in the project totally fine. Like, I don't expect you to understand that, but I, I do expect at least some understanding of, of how to approach things. Um, and uh, let's see here. I also want to remind you that this, this presentation from Jack Rosenthal um, that he uses for OS or used for OS at some point um, is actually really pretty good. Um, and has a kind of a, a, an overview of how you can translate your C++ knowledge to C. So if, if that's still something that's catching you up, make sure to review that. Also, I think the starter code is pretty extensive um, and well-documented. If there's something that isn't documented well enough, let me know and I will add more documentation. Um, but reading code is a huge skill that you will need to have in industry if you go to industry. And quite frankly, if you stay in academia as well, um, if you can't look at some code and you know, read it and understand what it's doing, that's going to, you know, you're going to do more reading of code probably than writing of code if you're, if you're going into industry, most definitely. Um, like, I definitely read way more code than I write. Um, another, another thing, asking questions, you, you've just got to ask questions. Like if, uh, if you don't tell me what's confusing about the starter code, I'm not going to know how to help you. So, uh, and I'm more than willing to walk through bits of the starter code and say, oh, this is what it's doing because I wrote it. And it's like, maybe <laughs> getting that translation into your brain is a bit hard. And I totally get that. But you just have to have to um, actually ask the question. Um, as far as uh, other other bits of like 
getting help as far as catching up. If you, you know, missed a homework or whatever, just always look for the extra credit. Um, there's going to be extra credit sprinkled out through all throughout different uh, assignments. There'll be, you know, one point here, one point there, five points here. So just be aware of that and do take advantage of it. Um, and then last, last thing on getting help, I just want to remind you that the lectures page has a bunch of additional links here that are kind of, uh, if you hated my explanation, go look here. And if those don't help you, then, you know, you can, you can always email me and um, I'm more than willing to, to uh, explain further. As far as lectures, um, so there were some people who kind of uh, felt like I don't prepare for lectures and that's incorrect. I don't rehearse the lecture because I don't got time for that, but I do prepare extensively for these lectures. So um, I, I think some of that is just due to the, my kind of way of speaking, um, especially if you're remote. And this is why I recommend that you show up in person. If you're in person, you can watch me flail my arms around and it makes a lot more sense. If you're remote and you don't see the sort of secondary um, uh, communication methods, it's gonna look like I don't know what I'm doing or sound like I don't know what I'm doing. So um, also if I'm pausing, it's likely because I'm drinking more water. And also, I, I do try and uh, follow Abraham Lincoln's advice, and um, uh, which is better to remain silent and be thought a fool than open your mouth and remove all doubt. So I don't want to say anything outright stupid. I try not to, at least. I, I still do manage that. Um, as far as showing up early, sorry, like I have a day job. Um, I do my best. And I think underlying these que these questions as, as far as um, um, the lecture goes, I, I think there may be a, a question, a worry that um, about qualification and my qualifications for this class. Um, I think that's fair. I think it's totally fair, but it's not something that you should address to me. Go straight to Dr. Camp or to Dr. Wu and, uh, and tell them because they're the ones who you know, make the, the decisions as to who teaches these classes. And sorry that the pacing is either too fast or too slow. If everyone's complaining about it being one or the other, then I think I'm doing a good job. Um, and it is additionally uh, uh, difficult because of the, the hybrid nature of this class I have. I have Zoom, I have you guys here in person. Um, oh, sorry. It would help if I you know, actually turned on the camera that I was talking about. Uh, did we make the 75% participation? Yes. So you should see in Canvas, I think there's an extra 10 points for you. And obviously, uh, just a reminder, the slides are always posted. That, that is one feedback item that I, I did take from last semester it, it, to, to post the slides before class. Okay, so the midterm. Um, so I'll let you know by the end of the week when we'll have the midterm and you'll have at least two weeks warning. Most likely it'll be on the 22nd. We'll, uh, so that's, um, That's here. Let me zoom this in. Since you guys probably don't have a magnifying glass. Oh. So that's here. Uh, we're here, obviously. Um, and most likely that'll make the 17th a review day. That gives me the entire weekend to write the test. I'm not going to write it until after the review. Um, and, 
let's see here. We'll make it, we'll make every, all the content up till the 10th fair game. So that's just tentative. I'll, I'll, I'll confirm this by the end of the week, but that will be the, the, the tentative plan. All content up till uh, the 10th will be fair game for the exam. We'll, we'll still have class on the 15th, um, but that will not be covered. And then 17th will be review, 22nd will be the actual exam. It'll be take home, you'll have 24 hours to complete it. So it should only take you, like I'm gonna design it such that you should only need like a class period, so like an hour and 15 minutes to take it. But if it so happens that you're like busy at this time or you know need more time for any reason, then you have the whole 24 hours. Uh, and I'll, I'll probably do it like, like, you know, uh, 8 a.m. on the 22nd till 8 a.m. on the 23rd. As far as the course schedule, th these were some really good feedback, honestly. Um, uh, so as far as like, are we pacing at the right, right speed? The answer is yes. Um, I know it's been a little bit crazy with, you know, I, I, I give out a worksheet and then like don't get to it. But um, that's kind of expected. Most of these topics I expect to take two or three lectures. And I just wanna uh, also give you some reassurance as far as the, the, the content that we're going over. Um, you know, these are kind of the list of topics that we're definitely going to get to. Um, and of them, we've gotten through this, 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 this one, this one, and we're right here. So we're, we're pretty well on track. We'll finish up pipelining today, talk about branch prediction starting tomorrow or not, not tomorrow, Wednesday. Um, and Mo, we'll see if we get to out, th this will be the question as to whether or not we get to this before the midterm or not. So, uh, however, uh, there were some really good, good feedback on, on the schedule. And I will admit I have been bad about updating it. So I will continue to do, to do that. Can, for the test, can we use a function we've written or one online to do hex to binary? Would we ex be expected to do that by hand? It'll be open note, open internet, whatever. Um, so yes, the answer is yes. The questions, I'm gonna hate myself for this, but they're gonna be a lot more conceptual, um, a lot more, you know what are the advantages and disadvantages of of different uh, uh different options so i'm gonna hate it because i'm gonna have to grade it and it's gonna be terrible but i'm not gonna quiz you on trivia that you can just look up on the internet when it's an open note test so um uh anyway that that's a great question alex as far as the project like Free publishing them? Yeah, sorry, they're not public. I'm not finished writing the starter code. So um, I should have I should have project two starter code and everything finalized by next week, which is when I'll probably assign it. But I, I kind of don't want to like inter interfere with midterm as well. So we'll we'll see when that actually gets assigned. Okay, that was a bit of a whirlwind. Sorry for the for the the bit of uh, <laughs> diversion here, but I just wanted to make sure that you guys know of all of the different things that are available to you. Um, you know, COVID is hard, like, and so I'm trying to be as available as I can, and you know, also considering that I have a a day job, I think hopefully hopefully there's enough coverage. So any questions? And then we'll hop into the actual, you know, content.
All right. So uh, let's remember where we were almost, well, five days ago now. So we were talking about pipelining and kind of the, the challenges that accompany it. So just a reminder as far as what is pipelining, it's taking these quote unquote multiple loads of laundry and compressing them down by utilizing all of the resources at all times rather than you know considering it one whole resource that has to be used and then you can go on to the next thing. Um, we have been working with this model where we have um, kind of five different stages that our processor goes through on each instruction. First, we have to like actually get the instruction. This is the instruction fetch. Um, then you have to decode the instruction and pull from the registers. This is the instruction decode or, or register file um, uh, step. And in this step, we figure out what instruction it is and pull out the necessary values from the registers so that we can actually do the computation, whether that's for a uh, matrix, uh, not matrix, memory address computation, or for um, just doing a um, uh, arithmetic operation in the ALU. Then we actually do the arithmetic operation in the execute or evaluate stage. Um, and then on step four, we go out to memory and fetch from there. And then lastly, we have to store whatever result back to our register file. And this is you know, pretty important because if we can't write back, then there's, there's really no point in doing any computation because it, it will never hit anywhere that we can actually use. Okay, so we looked at a couple of different um, uh, diagrams. I'm gonna, we, we covered this last time, but just remember what we have done is we've kind of split it up into different sections corresponding to each of those stages that we described a couple of slides ago. Okay, then we got into the different kinds of hazards. Structural hazards involve stuff like accessing the same resource at the same time. So maybe accessing memory, accessing registers at the same time. Uh, data hazards involve dependencies on previous instructions. Um, and then control hazards involve uh, decisions such as branches and dependencies on that. So uh, that'll really determine which instruction you need to fetch next, for example. All right. So uh, let's see here. Where we ended was this. So we were looking at, at bypassing, which is where we can kind of forward on uh, data back through the pipeline to previous instructions or new and in next instructions that are in previous stages of the pipeline. So uh, for example, like here, uh, the, the computation will be done on the ALU stage and we can forward it back to, the, to be able to come in on the ALU stage for the next cycle, which is for instruction two, okay? So I um, guess that's the answer, but <laughs> what we'll do now is we'll do this worksheet and the the idea here is that we now have an eighth stage pipeline okay so this is a little bit different we have decided to go ahead and split up the decode and register read um stages so these are now instead of one stage or of the pipeline it's two um we have also made two alu stages. So it's going to take two to do the whatever memory address computation or ALU op. And then we also have two memory uh, operations as well. So uh, the question is, 
for the following pairs of instructions. So this is kind of, you know, these two ads and then add an uh, LD and add LD and SD, LD and SD. Um, how many stalls will the second instruction experience with and without bypassing? And let's recall from back up here what a stall is. We have to, if, if, uh, if we realize, oh shoot, we don't have this data yet, we're just gonna have to delay executing this instruction. We'll send a no op through the rest of the uh, pipeline, and then we'll wait until it get, actually hits our register file. Um, that's if we don't have uh, any, any bypassing. So I'll do the first one kind of with you to sort of uh, get us going. And let me pull this up. And wait, where's the full script? There it is. Okay. So we'll copy. Um, I'll just copy in the the different stages. I F D E R. R A L no oh gear. I can't even write A L A L D M D M and then right. Okay, I just sure right. Okay, so I've copied in the uh, the pipe the pipeline stages for this first one. So the question becomes. How many stalls will this ad need? And I think the first the first question that we need to ask is, is there a dependency? So is there a dependency? What is the dependency on? Yeah. Register three. What kind of a dependency is this? Read after write, yeah, yeah, exactly. So we're we're reading R three after we've written to it in the previous instruction. So yeah, exactly. This is a read uh, after write. Okay. So going back here, the next question is: so we do. An instruction fetch um, on the next cycle, right? And then on on the next cycle, when when the when the previous instruction is doing this register read, can we be doing anything in for the second instruction? Can we be doing the next? pipeline stage. So what is the next pipeline stage for, for this one, for the second instruction? Two new messages. We can decode, yeah, DE. So we can decode the instruction, right? We kind of need to decode it before we determine if we need to stall. Um, for example, if if this was R5 or you know R6 or whatever, we wouldn't need to stall because there would be no dependency. So we do have to go ahead and do the decode stage or we do want to, so we can know if we need to execute this instruction. And then we, uh, we have to figure out if we, we can do anything here in the, in the third cycle for this second instruction. 
The third thing that we have to do is the register read. Where are these stages assigned? So there, you kind of just have to know the the nomenclature. Um, I think they're they're also on the worksheet. So there's instruction fetch, then decode, instruction decode, register read, two ALU stages, two memory stages, and a register write stage. Um, so can we do the read? No. Okay. So why can't we do the read? The first one has to write back to R3 first, right? So this is assuming no bypassing, we're gonna have to wait until it's it's done and we can uh, um, uh, actually have the data and it's gonna be done over here, way over here. All right, so we're gonna actually have to stall one, two, three, four, five times on instruction two. And then finally, on this cycle, the first instruction will write back to the register and we'll be able, oops, gonna spill my water. Uh, we'll be able to proceed on with the next stage of our second instruction, which is register read. Okay, that looks pretty bad. So that's without bypassing. So we have we have five stalls if we don't have bypassing. So let's see how does this change if we actually have bypassing. The question with bypassing is when will you get the data? That's the first question to ask. So when in this first instruction are we going to actually get our data? Yes. It'll be after the second ALU stage. Yeah. So we just assume that it's going to take both ALU stages to do the um, addition. And what that means is that now we have the data here. So instead of, so we know what the data is all the way over here, but we don't actually write it back until here. But with, with this bypassing, we can kind of forward on the data into the next instruction. And uh, the question is how, how many of these stalls can we get rid of? So obviously, let's just get, let's go all the way here. Um, I think that, so the, the first question is, when do we need, the next question is, when do we need the data for our second instruction? So which part of this pipeline do we actually need it in? need it by by the ALU stage yeah so we don't need it in for register decode we just need it to show up in our pipeline by the ALU the first ALU stage which means that um, we can kind of we don't since we don't need that value computed uh, with, when we're doing the instruction decode uh, or you know any other register read because we have this bypass that kind of muxes into the ALU stage coming in the, for the second instruction. Uh, we can, it's totally fine to read something that's invalid and then overwrite it with the bypass. Okay, and that's what this is kind of demonstrating. So we're able to over over here, Go ahead and let's see here. Oh, that didn't work. 
do our register read, then we can stall, and then do start doing the ALU ops. Ta -ta -ta. Yes. Correct. Yeah, so this is assuming that we don't know the result of the addition until the second ALU stage is over and that we need the results for both of these ALU stages. So that's where we get this one. Now you could also decode stall and then do the register read, that's fine. It, uh, it doesn't have much bearing as to which one, which one of these slots you stall in. What does matter is that you don't start the ALU stage until you have this forward. Okay, any questions on this first one? One question for me. Um, so why didn't we do the register read in the first, the first question? So the first edition. Why did we wait to do the register read? Uh, so when we didn't have bypassing? Yeah, yeah. So when we didn't have bypassing, the reason that we have to wait is because the value is not stored in the register until this last stage here. So but you said it's okay to get a, an invalid number from the read. Uh, yeah, so that's only if, so it's okay to get an invalid number from the read from the register if you have this bypass that overwrites it with the correct value from the previous instruction. Okay. So the the read write at the end won't override the value in the register. Well, the the re, the, the register write at the end will right. override the value in the register. Um, but we we've computed that value already after the ALU stage, so we can just forward it back. And even though we maybe read the wrong, a stale value from the register file on instruction two here, that's okay. It gets overridden by the bypass. Okay. But I don't, okay. I don't get how the register write at the end, it does, it, it also overrides the register read. So why do we, why do we have to wait to do the register read? Because it's just going to override it, so we'll be fine. I guess I'll ask you later. And... Well, so so remember, kind of the registers you can think of as just a really, really, really small memory, right? Okay. And so, um, if you haven't finished writing to memory, uh, you know, th this is where the memory write, if you will, the register write finishes. By this time, you know, if you have another instruction that's 10 instructions down or whatever that needs to pull from R3, then that's fine. Because it's already in the in the in the register. But if your next instruction has a problem, then that's when you you have to do this bypassing or or just stall a lot to get to uh, to make sure that the, the write has finished. Yeah, uh, we can. Yeah, yeah, I'll keep thinking. Discuss about them it. later. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Yeah, uh, Appendix C is also a good resource. Okay. Any other questions? And then I'll, I'll let you do the next two or next three. Cool.
merge your two all in Oh, that's a great question. So, so the question was, does load go through all eight steps? Yes. So we, we do actually need the ALU stage because we have to calculate the actual memory address to go, go fetch. All right, does anybody have a how many uh, dolls we need without bypassing on the second example? Five again. Five again. Yeah, it's the same logic, right? You, you don't get the value. The value of R2 hasn't been written to your register until the end of the instruction. So you have to stall until the end of the instruction. For the DM, since there are two, does one represent something different? Or is it the system just takes two steps because of time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's um, since there are two, they just represent um, uh, that it, it's going to just take two cycles to do that. Are we limited to only AL2 to AL1 bypass for the second half? No, so we can we can do any bypass, any conceivable bypass for these. If we So how many stalls are we going to need for the, the second instruction on this, uh, on this example? I okay, have a vote for one. I have some two votes for three. Oh, dear. Way just crashed. That's good. By that I mean very bad. Okay, that's fine. Do, do, do. Pipelining hazards. Oh, guess it didn't save that. That's fine. I'll copy these in again. R R A L A L D 
um, DM R W. Okay, so let's look at this in detail. Oh, I need to actually share the screen again. Give me just a second. Oh dear. All right, plan C. We will go with them. Okay, so let's let's do this. Uh, I F C E R R L L G M G M R W. Okay, so so this is our this is our first instruction. The second one we can do the instruction set just like last time. We can do the decode. We can do the register read because we have bypassing. Um, so, the, again, the first question is, where do we get the data? When, when, after what stage will we know the value that's going to hit R, R2? So, so this is a load. So loading into the CPU after the memory. Okay, so this is yeah after the basically right here is where we'll know that the value that's um, going to be written to R two. And then the the other question is where do we need it for this instruction? Which stage? First ALU. So basically, we have to do something such that the ALU stage starts here, right? And then something is a stall. So we're going to have to stall for the, both of these. Okay. That's with the bypass. That's with the bypass. Yeah, without bypass, again, it's just you gotta you gotta go all the way here, and then you also have to do the register read here. And as you can tell by the fact that it's overflowing in Vim, this is not very very cool. We don't like this. So, yeah. Let me let me go ahead and actually copy that. And I'll do something like this. Okay. Oh, uh, register what? Register read. Sorry. Um, does it matter if you stall here? Like before the register read or after, um, I I think either's fine. The, the, I guess the one thing that that stalling before helps with is that let's just say that this previous instruction was um, was this, where both of our operands to the add depended on on this guy and then 
then we might have a situation where um, I, I guess I'd need another one more instruction. So just pretend there's another instruction and this is shifted another like frame back and then some other instruction here. Now the register read, uh, register write has happened before the register read. We don't need any circuitry and re really crazy logic to do that bypass. So it may be advantageous to do the register read as close to the ALU stage as possible, just so that previous instructions can have a chance to have their values retired to the register. Is that the same for the previous example? Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, so um, let's see here. Third one, how many, how many do we need here? Is this third one a write after write uh, data dependency? Um, no, so what's happening here is that we're loading whatever is at the memory address pointed to by R1 into R2. And then we're storing whatever's in R3 into the thing pointed to by R2. Yeah, pointers is basically what this is. So pointers are, are bad in general for performance. Question here. Mm -hmm. Do we need it for which one? Um, we do not need it for instruction decode. So, de so decode of this is just saying, pull it out of register two, not like, and then the store requires the value out of register two, not the, you know, act not the, the register number. That make any sense? Decode tells us, well, so the instruction fetch just gives us, gets the instruction into a buffer. And then we have to, in this decode stage, figure out what do we have, what, what operations do we have to do? And we send that to our control, uh, controller right that controls the rest of the pipeline um, and it we don't know until after we've decoded the instruction what operands we need what dependencies there are etc okay so effectively the Right, yeah, exactly. So, so this is basically saying um, store at some X and that X is what we grab out of R2, but R2 was just written to on the previous instruction. So, so there's, there's a, this is actually a, uh, um, a read after write dependency. So anybody figure out how many stalls we need for without bypassing on that one? Five. Yeah, we're still gonna need five because we need to, you know, we need we need this. Um, this R2 value to be in the register file by the time we, uh, we start on uh, the register read. 
Okay, so hence the answer on this one is five two. <laughs> Without bypassing, you pretty much always, if you have this dependency where where you've written um, and then you need to read immediately. You're going to have, without bypassing, you just have to stall the entire pipeline until the last stage when it gets actually written to the register file, and then you can proceed. So we'll get that out of the way. Um, the answer for without on all these is five. The with case is a bit more difficult. So let me, let me see here. LD R1 into R2, and then SD. R2, R, whoops, R3. Okay, so the question becomes, where again, where do we know the value that R2 is gonna have? After data, okay, after, after, Going and getting the memory, VM2. Yep, exactly. Where do we need it for the store? Yeah, the beginning of, of the data one. So since this one, um, we don't need it for the ALU operation because there's no like offset with this one. So we can get rid of a couple stalls. And bypass right here. So after the the DM from the load, the second one is finished. We can forward it on to the first uh, data memory um, stage for the second instruction. Okay. Uh, now, what if I change this to like we were doing? store at R2 plus some constant four. Does that change the math of when you have to do, how many stalls you have to do? Yes. Yeah, so we need it for the ALU operation now. Basically, this, you know, we're going to need this, uh, this value for our first ALU uh, stage. OK. Last one. We already know it's going to take five stalls to do this without bypassing. With bypassing, what is it going to take? So I'll copy this over. And we're storing. So, um, What kind of a dependency is this? Right after right? Um, not really. So we're, we're loading whatever's located at the memory address pointed to by R1 into R2. So we're pulling out of, you know, we're using the value of R1, looking in memory at that location, pulling it out, putting it in R2. And then for the store, we're looking at the value of R3. Um, and we are then taking what we just loaded in from R2 and shoving that into them. Yeah. 
to read off the right. Yeah, so this is another read off the right. Um, so what, um, how many stalls do we need? Where do we need the data for this operation by? Yeah, for, for this for this one here. Yeah. We, we, yeah, we don't need it until we need to write. So we don't need it until the memory. Okay, so effectively what that means, this is where we have our GM, GM our W, uh, and then we have to fill in the rest of the stuff. Can we do the ALU stages? There's no dependency. Um, and we can also do the register read. We can just read register three. That's, that's fine. Um, because um, even though we, we need register two, we'll have it by the time we actually need it in our pipeline. So we can do register read as well. Okay. Okay. Does that make sense for the third one? Yes. Question. You could put the stall here, I guess, but um, this this causes um, you to have to look back further in your instruction list, basically, to look for dependencies. Yeah, so, so either is fine um, as far as the concept goes, but this is probably preferable. And for, okay, so actually going back to the third one here, I think the, yeah, I misspoke. This one's also three. So we're assuming that we do have a computation with, with R2. So we do need it by the ALU stage. We can be a bit smarter as, as, as kind of, I was alluding to where, hey, we look at the instruction, we notice that there's no offset, then we can, we can kind of, reduce the number of stalls but in the general case if you have a store um if you if you have th this sort of dependency where you're uh where you need to look up the address that you just got from the the load you're gonna have to stall so that you get, get it by the alu stage so like More like this. Okay. I'll, I'll post those solutions after on on this weekend as well. Okay. Any questions? We're running low on time. So yeah, bypassing is cool. It's going to be very useful. Now, that was that's talking about these um, these data hazards. Let's look now at control hazards. These again come up when you have a branch, so an if statement or uh, or just a normal jump. And the reason why it's a problem is we need to figure out what is the next program counter. Okay. So let's let's figure out what we actually need to calculate where we're gonna need to fetch the next instruction from. The recording will be posted this evening. Yeah. Okay, so for jumps, um, so this is just a, a pure jump with a massive immediate. We just need the opcode, we need the offset, so that that the you know, like the 25 or 26 bits, 27 bits uh, 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 for the offset. 
and the current program counter because it's just a massive offset from where we are. So that's jump, but jumps are not the only thing we need. We need also to be able to do jump to a value that is specified in a register. Uh, and this involves um, not only the opcode, so all these require the opcode, we need to know what instruction we're doing. Um, and then we also need a register value. So this has to have, we also need to read from the register file in this case. For conditional branches, uh, we need the opcode, the program counter, we need the register that we're using for the conditional. So it's just like branch if not equal to zero or branch EQZ or whatever. And um, then that we need to know which register we're looking in. And then we also need the offset. And for everything else, though, all we need is the opcode and the current program counter. Right. For everything else, it's just going to be plus four. If it's not a branch or a jump, then we'll just go to the next instruction. Okay. So one thing to note is that all of these require opcode. When do we know the opcode? Well, we know it um, after we do the instruction decode. Okay, so for example, let's just say that we have two just arithmetic operations. We have um, R0 plus R10 putting it into R1, and then R2 plus R17 putting that into R3. But if we if we don't have if if uh, if we're being naive and we're like well shoot we only fetched it we haven't decoded it we don't know if this is going to be a branch yet we're going to have to we're going to have to wait um, you're basically going to have to um, do the instruction decode and then you can figure out oh okay yeah I I can go ahead and fetch this next instruction I2. Um, and if we look at the, if we look, if we look like on this one, no, it doesn't look too bad. We just have kind of two instruction fetches. But when we look at the actual resource usage, it's pretty bad, right? Instruction one has to be fetched and then decoded before we start on instruction two. And there's a bunch of no ops. There's a bunch of wasted time in our pipeline. Um, we're gonna get a CPI of two at the very, very minimum. Um, uh, so that's not good. We don't like CPI that's really high. Um, especially when all we're doing, ID and DE are synonyms. Yes, that is correct. Great question. Uh, yeah, especially when we're doing just Arithmetic operations, we don't want our CPI to be two. That's pretty terrible. So let's just assume that it's always going to be plus four. And if it's not, then we can fix it. All right. So this is basically um, showing us that we have our program counter. We always do a plus four add and then loop it back around to be put back into the program counter. And um, if we ever guess wrong, if it's not the uh, just plus four, then we'll have to kill uh, the next, the, the current, whatever is currently in the pipeline. So after we do our, um, uh, for, for example, if we just have a jump instruction, after we've done the decode in this uh, second stage, we'll know, oh, shoot, this is a problem we had to do a jump. And so then you can go ahead, you can kill whatever's um, currently uh, being being fetched. Any questions? So with this new thing, 
after we've decoded that, oh, this is a jump, we'll just send no op through the rest of the pipeline for the, for the next instruction. Abort, cancel, undo, um, that's fine. We, we only fetched it. We haven't actually done any, any writes. Okay, so this is just two different diagrams of the same concept. This is looking at it by instructions and, and where they are in, in the pipeline. This one is looking at uh, from research, resource usage perspective and you can see, um, let's see here, after we have decoded with uh, the instruction two, we realize, oh, shoot, we're gonna have to, uh, we're gonna have to cancel. We're gonna have to cancel whatever I3 is and we'll fetch I4. All right. Now that's well and good. But this is a jump instruction. It only involves the opcode and the offset. What happens if we have a conditional branch where we have to do a computation and then figure out if it's zero or not? So this is going to be a little bit more problematic. What if we have this guy? Uh, we have an add, and then we have this branch equal to zero R1. And then this is the offset that we need to go to. So if it's equal to zero, then we would jump 200 uh, bytes forward. All right, so we go ahead and we can go ahead and fetch um, instruction three. At that point, instruction two will be being decoded. Uh, and then we'll send instruction two into our ALU stage, it'll be computed. And our instruction three will be in the decode stage. Our instruction, let's just call that 3.5, um, instruction at 108 is gonna be being fetched right now. And yeah, we have to figure out what we need to do in this while while we're decoding um so we don't we don't really know until way over here whether or not it's a branch so the trick again is we're just going to have to kill the next two instructions now instead of killing just one um and, and the nice thing about well the sort of nice thing about branches is sometimes they're not a branch. So sometimes you guessed perfectly and you're fine. Um, you, you know, this was a false condition, so you never jumped and you can just proceed like nothing happened. It's only when you actually take the branch and you're like, oh, shoot, okay, now I have to go and um, assume, I have to go and kill the next two instructions. So I'm gonna have to kill instruction 104 and 108, whatever in the, decode stage now, we're going to have to send no op through the rest of the pipeline uh, to make sure it doesn't actually do any, any damage. And also whatever is being fetched, you know, we have to get rid of that as well. So let's look at the diagrams. I think these are pretty helpful. Again, we know by the execute stage, uh, it was taken, we're going to have to forward no op through the rest of the next two instructions, because we assumed that it was going to be not taken, and uh, now, now we're uh, we're in kind of hot water. We're going to have to cancel these. Okay, a any questions before we head out? We'll finish up this, I guess, on on Wednesday, and then we'll start on more branch prediction.